When it comes to TIG welding on pipe, everyone wants to learn how to back feed. But we got to learn a little bit about the fundamentals. Let's break it down a little bit. Now out of the 16 years that I've been welding, five of those years I've been an educator, and that entire time, open root TIG welding is something that I've not only done the most, but I've also taught the most. And when it comes to back feeding, we got to consider a few things. I put it down here at the bottom, but I think this is, should be number one. Do you need to back feed in the first place? This is all gonna come down to a lot of variables as far as positioning where that pipe is located, how big of a gap do you have, what type of route you're looking for as far as reinforcement, and the speed at which things need to get done. These are all silly variables that will change depending on where you're at. We'll just talk 5G because it's usually the bane of most students' existence when it comes to learning how to get good reinforcement on a back feed weld joint. You're looking for root reinforcement at a minimum of a 16th of an inch to an eighth of an inch max. And that's gonna be controlled by where you put your wire. And that's why you'll see a lot of welders putting that wire through the gap and feeding from the back side of their root as they come up and around this pipe. People think that you have to weld or you have to feed directly from the back side, the opposite side of that pipe. And that's not true. You just need to hold your wire to the back side. So you could be anywhere in here, even at this point, as long as your wire is on the back side of your root, you're still kind of back feeding. What this really looks like on a 5G weld, at the bottom side, where we need the most reinforcements, we need to hold our wire on the back side of our gap, which means that we're gonna need a wider gap than the wire size we're using. If we have a tighter gap, we can go down in wire size. It's not my preferred method. I usually would like to open up the gap if I can. We're gonna need a bigger gap so that we can get our wire to the back side. So as gravity breaks down this wire, we still have reinforcement, even though it's gonna to wanna to sink down a little bit. Here on the side of the pipe, we're gonna to wanna to hold our wire a little bit more dead in the middle, splitting that thickness of the wire right in the edges of our bevel. The edges of your bevel can pose a problem too if you have them too sharp. For a back feed wider gap technique, especially on Schedule 40 pipe, which is thinner, you might opt for just a smidge of a land, just break that edge off and it'll help that metal grab those edges without undercutting as we keep our wire in the middle. On the top side of the pipe, we gotta keep our wire kind of towards the top side of our edges so that gravity, again, does its thing to sink that weld in, but we gotta let this wire break down and sink into the root. Now, why would you need to back feed in the first place? I would say pretty much anytime there's a wider gap or you're in a tight spot. So you see a lot of people looking through the gap. We're gonna go over that today too. Check this absolute unit out. We're gonna be using the Thunder 255 MTS from Everlast today. I'm stoked to get some use out of this machine. It is a powerhouse, man. It's got a bunch of amps, bunch of bolts, all the beans you need. Today, we're gonna to be using the DC TIG feature. It does, of course, have DC stick, and of course, all the other different types of modes for your MIG welding as far as stainless steel, aluminum, carbon steel with different gases, even synergic pulse, which I'm stoked about. I don't have a single machine in my shop that has pulse MIG, so we'll be seeing a lot of that later down the road. Let me know what kind of pulse MIG videos you guys wanna see in the comment below. We're gonna keep things as field as it goes, and I'm stoked that they put this on the machine. And if we don't wanna worry about a remote, or maybe we can need a little bit more of a field ability. We can go to this live arc start, which is a lot like a scratch start setup on here. We don't need remotes, we don't need anything, but it still will turn our gas on for us. Normally you'd run the gas through the backside of this machine and have the quick connect. You notice I got a different type of connection on here. I took my heavy hitter TIG rig, which is what I like to TIG weld with, especially when welding pipe because of the two piece setups and it can handle a range of heat from the stuff that we're gonna do on the route to what we might put on on a hot pass and a cap. Uh, we've got the argon running straight into the TIG rig so we bypass the gas on the machine. And I've just changed the connection that normally comes with the TIG rig on the back here. I almost always use a number 10 cup on most pipe welds that I make, even if they are small bevels. Instead of maybe scooting that cup, I might tend to step the cup. Uh, we are gonna be using an outlaw leather hood. We're not gonna be using an auto dark in the actual hood itself. Reason being is, especially when we start doing open root TIG and looking through the gap, I haven't found a single auto dark hood that won't flash on you. So we need a nice lens like this one from Vitted View. This is a number 10, super clear, super nice. I think he calls it the Big Lebowski. Okay, we got our piece of five inch pipe schedule 40. We're gonna get into putting a root in this thing. Now I've got my welding machine off and I always like to try to start with a dry run. This is a, we'll call it a piece of pipe that requires a bit of reinforcement, has a wider gap, enough where we can get that wire in all the way around. Anytime I come up on a fit up like this, it's likely I'm gonna end up back feeding it. I'm not gonna come in from the top. I find that this is pretty difficult to maintain as far as keeping your wire where you need it. It also tends to get loose and it's hard to find its home, you know? What I like to do is 
use that filler metal, brace up on the pipe, don't grab too much, and I'm actually gonna be looking at it from underneath as I feed in right here. Now right into this tack, we wanna make sure that we get things nice and warm. Once it's warm, we can start to introduce that filler metal, and we actually need to push a little bit. We wanna feel in that first, like, up to an inch of weld, maybe just a hair. I'll even roll my wire in my finger a little bit to help with that surface tension and feed into it. What we're looking for a, on a back feed type of puddle is kind of a sticky puddle. You might hear me say this often, but I want a puddle that I can stick to these edges. I don't want a super wet puddle where it's like really hot, right? So it's basically gonna be adjusting our amperage to control the amount of sticky puddle we get. So we're at 95 amps. I'm gonna look from the bottom and come to the top compared to a weld that we're gonna look through the gap on the second side. Okay, we're gonna do our best with all these cameras in my face. Once you find that gap, like I said, you wanna get that edge nice and warm. Once the edge of that tack is nice and warm, you can introduce that filler metal. And you wanna give it a little bit of a shove in the hot spot of your puddle so you know that you don't leave a little low spot there. You don't wanna to shove too hard and get a cold wire but you can see that even though I'm getting the reinforcement that I need, I'm not really feeding a whole lot from the top. I'm really pretty much linear in line with my bevel, but I'm holding that filler metal on the back edge of my bevel edges. Just trying to go edge to edge of my bevels. We wanna try not to let our wire disconnect like that. Not that it's a big problem, it's just gonna make your root look a little bit more inconsistent. I had to reposition the cameras. Same thing with the bottom tack. Anytime you relight up on that root pass, just go ahead and get that area nice and warm. Same thing when you re-enter your filler metal, make sure you give it a little, just a little gentle push. That'll help make sure you don't leave a low spot. And we're gonna just try to walk the edges of this cup if you notice that your filler metal keeps coming out like that, it's okay. We're going to just kind of make sure that we move it around with our tungsten if we have to. Uh, usually it's a feeding thing, keeping that wire in that puddle. You don't need to feed metal on the side of the pipe. Gravity is going to let it, let it be heavy. We again had to reposition the camera there, so we're striking back up, getting that area nice and warm. You can feed from your gap. I like to sometimes use the top tack as a little bit of a guide, but you don't want to get carried away with shoving any wire up here. We're going to keep things nice and tight. The gap's just about as wide as the wire is. I want to treat this a lot like the side of the pipe. However, I do want to see a little bit more sink into the actual root itself, just so I know that gravity's doing its thing on the bottom. Now you see those those big droops and drips that keep happening? Uh, that's that knife edge I was saying. If we got rid of a little bit of that knife edge, that keyhole might be a little bit more manageable on the fit. It's still doing its thing. It's just going to probably make it look for a less desirable root with some more bumps in it unless we try that dip technique where we manage that. Tie it into our tack. Now I don't feather a whole lot of tacks when it comes to TIG welding. We're just going to sit on it and get it nice and hot. And then as you just kind of walk on over across the tack, you should blend it in. I'll get to the other end of the tack and then I'll let that blend in and roll out on the bevel edge. Now if we just take a peep inside of what we did right here, it's still even with that little bit of push. We didn't push enough in the bottom here because I'm just got like I can feel just a little bit of a bump. That's why it's so important to put in that push there at the bottom so we don't get any of that suck back. It's going to show up on x-ray, right? Right here is where it will normally happen. As we came up, we see the tie-in right here. We could still shove a little bit more into that tie-in because every time you pull that wire back, it usually gets a little just a skosh heavy. And then as we came up on their sides and then into the top, you can see we're a little bit heavier. Especially when that wire is starting to come out, you can see these couple little bumps. About an eighth of an inch at one of those bumps. I don't really want to see that eighth of an inch. That's like my max tolerance. I don't want to be there. I want to be somewhere around this, right here. About half the thickness of the eighth inch wire that I have in my hand. We're going to try this other side. Might have to open it up because it looks like after that root, we've got a little bit of tightness to it and we can't get in there. 
without opening that up. So we'll get that set up. So I'll show you kind of how my technique is gonna change from what we just did. Now I've already taken the liberty to open up my gap. Remember, if you're gonna backfeed, you're gonna need a big enough gap that you can move this wire fairly freely around. We wanna be able to reach from the top all the way down. And the things that we're gonna be doing differently is the wire and my head moved around the side of the pipe on this side. Whereas this one, my head and the wire are gonna stay in the same place. Now this is a great technique, especially when you can't get to the bottom or get your head under the bottom and there's not a lot of room. And we're gonna be looking at it like this. I've never been good at walking the cup just like I did this other side, how we walked that root in. This side, I'm definitely gonna have to freehand it. I'm likely going to have to pull my tungsten out a little bit more. And instead of the kind of the lean back that I had with the walking method, I'm actually gonna be trying to point directly perpendicular to my root, be a little bit ahead and almost pointing back so that I can see my tungsten and see my wire through this gap. I'm not the best at this. I know some welders, this is the way they'd rather do it. And it really is nicer to be able to just stay in one spot. Just go ahead and put your root in. I'm just not that steezy with it. The trick here is to find out where you can put your head, find out where that arc is on that tack. Go ahead and address that fisheye that was down there too. Once we get the edge of it hot, we can try to get our filler metal down there. Trying to balance where that wire goes. Got to kind of keep that tungsten in the front of your puddle and point back so you can see where it's at. Ooh, there is a little bit of coal wire in there. I'm glad I stopped the camera because I realized I didn't have the other one recording. It looks a lot like what I'm about to do, except across the bottom. I do see that piece of cold wire. I mentioned, guys, I'm not the best at this, but we're trying to keep our wire in the same place on the top. We're still just kind of using the edge of that weld that we finished up top as kind of a brace that we can push on and stay stable on and just feed up into that weld. When I get up to attack, definitely dab it closed. I usually dab from the top there. Kind of try to blend it in. I know I probably left some junk. And you can see it's getting tight here at the top, so I can't even get it in through the top unless I back feed it. Which, in my experience, at this point, you don't need to be feeding it this way because we have access from the top. Otherwise, you're really going to put in a heavy root. Just lay it in and let it sink. I turn the machine up a little bit to 110 amps, keeping that wire towards the top again, not to get too heavy of reinforcement, which is easy to do up here. If you feel yourself you're going to get a little too heavy, just grab a little bit more and bevel and don't feed in, but go wide. Get into that tie-in, pull that wire out. We've already had it feathered a little bit, cleaned up. And we'll let it soak in and just kind of freehand the rest up and out on the bevel. I will say this, one thing about this welding stuff, if you don't use it, man, you lose it. And it's been a while since I've attempted to put a TIG root in. This used to be my bread and butter. You can see we've got a lot more reinforcement on this root, being that we filled everything in from the top side. Everything just flows right into where we need. So we actually have an eighth of an inch reinforcement right down here got rid of that little fish eye off the jump and we still could have had a little bit better of fusing into that tech. We did a really good job all the way up through here. That little bit of cold wire that I thought I had, I was able to just kind of rub this wire across and it broke off. So that was nice. Didn't get that cold wire. Still a little bumpy up here. Not as reinforced actually as this side. We almost got the opposite effects of back feeding from the top versus through the side. I'm a lot more, I've always been a lot more consistent not having to come through the top and look through the gap. That's a tough technique. We got a nice beefy root. We're gonna see if we can't smoothen things up a little bit with a nice hot, hot pass. So we're gonna go to clean up the root, crank it up to about, let's say 180, and try to put a hot pass in here. Now, when you're welding in position on pipe, you gotta have a good root, especially when you're in a 5G position because gravity is still affecting you even on your hot pass. So one thing we're gonna pay attention to is the bottom reinforcement on both of these sides. We're running 177 amps right now and when you don't have as much reinforcement at that amperage, you might get yourself in a bind as far as getting that suck pack that you were trying to avoid by feeding into that root in the first place. So let's see what that might would look like.
Well, I did did what I wanted to show you, but not exactly where I wanted to show you. I was hoping to get the less reinforcement route kind of pulled back right in here, but it seems to have held up through the hot pass that we did. We were able to get enough meat in there or metal as far as our filler to not affect our our root pass. Now you see right here, that's where you can get into a lot of trouble and that's why it's important to have a lot of reinforcement. It just gives you a little bit of room for comfort if you have that amount of root in your bottom of your pipe as you go to do your hot pass, especially at a hotter amperages. Just it takes very little time for that to actually happen. But we were able to come up for all intents and purposes. The rest of the root is all there. It's a little heavy, I would say. And we have that one piece of suck back on the bottom. That's just from running your hot pass and staying in one spot too long. And that's where we had a lot of root too. At that point, guys, if it's gonna be an x-ray on your piece of pipe and you know you sucked back your root, you have two options. You could cut it open and try to fix it or cap or heavy. Well, we can't win them all, guys. And if this showed me anything, it's just how rusty I am. This used to be my bread and butter, but it looks more like peanut butter and potatoes now. You gotta keep after. If you guys really wanna get really slick with the processes, you gotta, you gotta use it. You gotta use it often. I used to be really good, and now I'm uh, really mediocre. But I hope you guys took some value and a lesson learned out of this episode. We'll see you all in the next weld. At least that side's still sharp.